Hi guys, my name's Thatcher and welcome to episode 8 of my DCTL coding tutorial series. We've actually already covered most of the important DCTL features, but in this episode I wanted to cover a handful of features that I don't use quite as often. So let's go ahead and discuss this first feature, .h, or header files. Now in this episode, I've already written the code that we're going to be talking about, and I'm just going to be walking through some examples for each of these four different constructs. So with header files in this example here, I've got basically three functions. That There's a matrix, matrix multiply, matrix vector multiply, and matrix copy. And in the transform function, I've defined basically this rec709 to rec2020 matrix that is by default populated all zeros. And then I've got two other matrices. This one's the official rec709 to xyz and the xyz to rec2020 matrices. Then I go ahead and multiply them together and store the result in my rec709 to rec2020 matrix. And then I multiply the input color by the rec709 to rec2020 matrix. The bottom line here is not necessarily that this math is interesting, but what I wanted to highlight was that these three functions are potentially fairly useful in a variety of different DCTLs. You might not want to be copying and pasting these three functions into every DCTL that's doing like matrix multiplies or copying a matrix from one buffer to another. So what you could do instead here is you could take all of these and put them into a header file and you could have multiple DCTLs that reference the same header file. So let's discuss how we would actually do this kind of header file thing. It's actually pretty simple. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new file and we'll call it matrices.h. And then all we're going to do is take our three functions that we have over here, we're gonna cut them out, and we're gonna paste them in matrices.h. Now, back in our h file example file, we're going to simply put the line, pound include, and then we're going to write the relative path to the matrices.h file. So the relative path, that means we're gonna take the directory that our current DCTL is in, and then we're going to write down how to get to this matrices.h. So in this case, it's in the same directory. So we'll just say matrices.h. But if, for example, matrices.h was in like the parent directory, we would say dot dot slash matrices.h. Dot dot meaning the parent directory above the current one. And the current one is in this lesson eight folder. So the parent directory would be in the DCTL tutorial folder. And therefore matrices.h would be in that directory. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this new DCTL tutorial H file example and the matrices.h header file to my LUT folder. We have to copy both of them. And in this Fusion project, I've already loaded up our tutorial 8 H file example. I'm going to hit reload and it still works as before. Okay. So that's .h files. So now you might ask, what are the pros and cons of using header files? In my opinion, there's maybe one big pro, which is that functions that you define inside a header file, you can reference them from many different DCTLs using our include statement. And that means you don't have to maintain several copies of these functions. Like if later you found out that there was a bug in one of these functions, you wouldn't have to go to several different DCTLs to update it. As a result, it helps you keep your code more organized and better maintained. There are a couple downsides that I'd like to point out. The first downside is that with these header files, you become dependent on the structure of your directory. For example, if I knew that this matrices.h file was in the parent directory, then I would need to make sure that whenever I put this DCTL file somewhere, in this DCTL's parent directory is this matrices.h file. If you're sharing your DCTLs with other people, it could be somewhat error prone as they may want to organize their DCTLs differently than you do. As a result in my own practice, I don't use header files. That way I can keep each DCTL fully self-contained. When someone wants to download one of my DCTLs, they don't need to download other files that are in the same folder or in another folder. So I think that makes it a lot easier for me to share my DCTLs. One other thing that I'd like to highlight is that DCTL, it's based on a language called C and C has this unique feature, which is called the preprocessor. What that means is that during compilation of your code, the first thing that happens is the preprocessor will look for statements like hashtag include as well as hashtag define. And for hashtag include statements, it will look up this file and literally copy and paste the source code that's within matrices.h 
into this location, replacing line number one in this case. So you do have to be aware of where you place your include statements inside your code. If I had other functions above it, then that would mean that this source code is paced below those functions. The last thing I want to mention about header files is that there is a little blurb about them inside the documentation, and you should feel free to read that. OK, I've decided to shuffle up the agenda a little bit and talk about constants next rather than defines. So let's hop into my constant example. In short, what's going on in DCTLs is that there's really only one way to have a global variable, which is to use constants. However, these global variables are read only, hence the name constant. So in this code example, I've got two different constants that are defined outside of any of the functions. The first one, I've used the constant qualifier followed by the type uh, params t, which is going to be one of these structures. And I've just defined it to be these two different values. And then I have a constant float, which is going to be pi, and that's going to be 3.14. So one nice thing about constants is that once they're defined, I can go ahead and reference them inside of my functions. For example, here pi is being referenced without being passed as a parameter to our function here, sum params times pi. Again, I reference our params constant down here and pass it into this function just to show you that you can pass these things in. So in all, we would expect this transform function, if you've been reading ahead, to simply compute 0 0.02 plus 0 0.05 and multiply that result by pi. I've gone ahead and copied that into this node here. We'll go ahead and hit reload and inspect the values. We get 0 0.21991. Those of you who are fast at math will recognize that as 0 0.07 times pi. So that's kind of a brief intro to constants. Again, with constants, there is a blurb about them inside the readme. Uh, the readme also describes a constant ref qualifier, which can be used when passing a constant pointer type to a function. Truthfully, I've never really found a good use for constant ref, so we'll move on from there. Next up, let's talk about define. So define is another preprocessor instruction, just like include. The way define works is that the preprocessor is going to go through your source code, and in this example of define pi 3.14, it's going to go through and look for every occurrence of pi in all caps that it can find within your source code. In this case, we've got one down here. The preprocessor will then replace all instances of pi with the contents in the second half of the define. So the syntax of define is going to be hashtag define, some kind of keyword, and then what you want to replace that uh, expression or keyword with. So here we've got pi, it's going to be replaced by 3.14 in parentheses over here inside this call. Hashtag define also supports arguments. So I can define what looks a lot like a function. In this case, it's called fill array with three arguments. And then the preprocessor will go through and look for all occurrences of fill array and its three arguments. It will then replace any occurrences of fill array with the three arguments with this for loop in this case. You might be able to see some advantage here. So you can see that fill array, for example, if we wanted to fill all entries of an array with a certain value, typically we would have to write a function and then we would be stuck with the specific type of that function. Whereas with this define, each call of fill array is simply expanded as code. So here I can call it on a float array. Here I can call it on an array of integers. And here I can call it on an array of float threes. If we go over to our DCTL for this and look in the lower left-hand corner down here, we can see that we're getting 2.54 for the first entry, which is going to be the zeroth entry of float array, 2.54 as expected. The next one is going to be 2.0, and the last one is going to be pi. We do see those three values in the lower left. Now, what are the pros and cons of using define? One benefit of using define is that it is a zero-cost abstraction. So these occurrences of pi here are going to be replaced at compile time with our number 3.14. If we compare this with our constant example, pi here is actually allocated a spot in the program memory. So pi takes up some space. When we use pi here, we have to reference the variable that's in our global like static memory. So that is somewhat slower than if we had just written 3.14 like right here instead. So define gives us some very minor efficiency gains. It also allows us to do this sort of thing where we have a untyped macro that 
we can just substitute into our code in these three different places as just direct code substitution. So this maybe is convenient. However, I will caution you that it is also very error prone. I can put any kind of garbage into the parameters here when I call fill array and the error messages may be less intuitive than you'd expect. I'd also highlight that in the second argument of define, it can be somewhat dangerous. For example, if you decided to have a semicolon in it like this with pi, then this would simply end the line right here. And that would result in a compile error because the two right parentheses and the semicolon would be in a separate statement. So there you have it defines or macros as you might call them. They can be useful in shortening your code, but at the same time, they could give you errors that are somewhat more tricky to debug. So finally, let's talk about define LUT. So DCTLs provide the capability of running a RGB color through a LUT. There are two ways to bring in a LUT into a DCTL. The first is using define LUT. With define LUT, we're first going to indicate a variable name that we want to use to reference the LUT. And then we're going to indicate the relative file path to that LUT. You'll notice there are no quotation marks in this, just like in our combo box, we don't have quotation marks around our two strings that are in here. In this case, I have to be careful about where I place this DCTL. I'm going to be placing it within my DCTL tutorial folder within my LUT folder. So then I'm going to go to the parent directory being the LUT folder and then go into the film looks directory and then pull out our classic rec 709 Kodak 2383 D65 cube LUT. And we're going to be able to reference that with my other LUT. Up here, we can call apply LUT, which is this other function that takes in your RGB colors as floats. And then it takes in my other LUT the variable that we define down here within define LUT. The other way to include a cube LUT within a DCTL is to use define cube LUT, and this allows us to place in a LUT in line within our DCTL. So we'll write define cube LUT. Inside the parentheses, we put in the variable name that we want to save this LUT as. Then we'll use curly braces. Within the curly braces, we're literally just going to take the whole LUT and paste it in without indenting it from the left-hand side. And we can leave in comments as well. One thing you'll notice is that we could put these two define LUT and define cube LUT statements below our transform function. That's not something that we can really do with most other resolve tools. We could have put these all the way up here, but that would mean that we'd have to scroll down pretty far before we get to the actual logic of our code. All right, so let's go into Fusion and take a look at this DCTL. Just upstream of it, I have transformed into uh, Rec 709 Cineon film log so that we get a somewhat reasonable looking image. And we can see that inside our define LUT. Here's the 2383 LUT. This is the one that is brought in using define LUT. And then we also have the Fuji 3513 LUT, which is the one that I've created using define cube LUT down here. Okay, so that covers define LUT. The main reason that I don't use define LUT is that when I'm writing a DCTL, I typically want to encode the exact math that I want to apply to the image. That way I can be deliberate and aware of every single operation that takes place within my DCTL. By using LUTs, sometimes it can be non-obvious when you've made a mistake. For example, if you feed a LUT an image that the LUT was not expecting, you can't really tell based off of the entire table of numbers whether or not you're doing the right thing when you passed an image into the LUT. All right, that pretty much concludes this episode of my DCTL coding tutorial series. In it, we discussed header files and when you should and should not use them. We discussed constants, which are like a global read-only variable. We discussed define or macros, which are another preprocessor instruction that allows you to make code substitutions in a somewhat scalable but error-prone way. And we talked about define LUT, which allows you to call a cube LUT within a DCTL. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next and final episode of this series.